few announcements uh, this morning. First of all, thank you to everybody that participated in our Torah service. Uh, Rabbi Brown, for your beautiful reading. Annette, where did you go? For your beautiful chanting. She was awesome. She's probably with, I, I can imagine I know exactly where she is. Um, and, uh, and to everybody that, that blessed, and to Jeffrey for uh, being our Gabbai this morning, and for all of you for showing up. We, we, we thought we barely had a minion, and now look, we're uh, a full house, but, but a, a warm house, so that's nice. Um, for those that weren't here last night, just to share a few of the announcements, uh, there, we're going to be leading three trips to Israel in the coming year. Uh, this spring, sorry, this summer, no, this fall, <laughs> Mary and Mike Coheen are, uh, <laughs> I, I, had, I had almost there, uh, Mary and Mike Coheen will be leading a trip um, in October. This coming spring in 2017, I'll be leading a, a family trip for those that uh, uh, want to have a bar mitzvah in Israel. This is a great trip to do that on as well. And we're having an informational meeting about that trip on Tuesday, May 10th. And then Cantor Tausik is leading a trip that's also going to focus on Israeli dance, right? Uh, this coming summer, next summer, the, in June of 2017. That was probably the most convoluted way I could give that announcement. Um, <laughs> I also want to draw your attention to next Sunday night, a truly phenomenal Jewish educator and Holocaust scholar, uh, Rachel Corzine, will be in our community. Um, Rachel is just phenomenal, and we've invited her to speak on t Sunday night at 7.30 for the entire community. She'll be talking about the Eichmann trial. Rachel was one of the directors of Holocaust education for the Israeli public school system. So she really comes with a wealth of knowledge and perspective. And then the following night, she's going to be giving an orientation for our Eastern European trip. Because her family is originally from Budapest, but she's an expert on the Jewish community of Budapest as well. Come Sunday night. You can come Monday also, which is at 7, even if you're not on the trip, just to, just to get the information. Uh, and then on Friday, May 20th, is our Temple Shalom U. Uh, it's the last in our series for the year. We'll start it up again after the High Holy Days. Uh, Lisa Pampania, uh, Steve Plotkin, and Greg Gardner, who I think you know, you've heard of him, um, are going to be teaching, and we're actually going to add a new element, which I'm not sure is applicable for anybody in this room, maybe one or two, maybe John. We're going to add a, um, a movie upstairs for kids, since it's a 6.30 service, and then uh, we're usually done by 7.30 or so, and then the lectures begin. So we'll have two movies upstairs, there'll be dinner as well. Uh, and they'll be child mining for kids, so they can stay. You can get some built-in child mining. The whole evening's done by nine. So if the kids aren't too young, this is a way for everybody to get out and get some get some learning. So we'll be uh, promoting that. That idea didn't occur to us until just recently. <laughs> I wish we had thought of it earlier, but at least we thought of it now. So any other announcements that I missed? Next uh, Saturday morning, um, Georgia Witten's bat mitzvah, and Sarah Chiachi is going to be speaking also a little bit about project sustenance in the Jewish Food Bank. So I wanted to let you know about that. Rabbi Stephen Greenberg is a, an American Orthodox rabbi. Uh, his ordination came from Yeshiva University in New York. And he's described as the first openly gay Orthodox rabbi. Last year, he wrote a powerful and important commentary on this morning's 12-portion Afre Mot. And I clipped it, and I said to myself, one day I'm going to share this with my congregation. This is that day. <laughs> As we skipped over the uncomfortable part that Jeff alluded to in his summary in this morning's Torah portion about the prohibitions against homosexuality and all of the other sexual mores that are mentioned in Torah, but particularly that one, it's worth noting that we, if we skipped all the uncomfortable parts of Torah, well, we, we wouldn't really have much to read and even less to, to uh, discuss. So I want to share with you Rabbi Greenberg's drosh on this Torah portion. He doesn't skip over the words, but confronts them head on. And so the following are his words, not mine, though his thoughts are my thoughts as well in many cases. I might have said more in some respects, but I'm not constrained by halakha as he is as an Orthodox rabbi. And yet still, within his constraint is a path, I think, for wholeness in our community to address the discomfort and the disconnect between our values of inclusion and our tradition in some cases, in this case in particular, of exclusion. So these are Rabbi Greenberg's words. He begins, I received a call this week. The Baal Kore, who chants the Torah portion at the shul that I attend, wanted to know what he should do when he arrives at Leviticus 18.22 in the reading. He 
felt uncomfortable simply reading the verse this year since I, my partner, and our child are full members of his community. It was a very moving question for me. He quotes, And with a male you shall not lie the lyings of a woman. It is an abomination. As well, in chapter 20 of Leviticus, the punishment of death is prescribed for violators. These two verses were a gauntlet of pain for me in my early 20s. Today, young people are coming to understand their feelings much earlier and must manage the experience with a good deal of less maturity. While the verse speaks about males, the larger cultural message seems clear. Same-sex desire is hateful, especially to God. What is it like for a 14-year-old to hear these two verses baldly read? Does he interpret the silence to mean that no one imagines it remotely possible that there is a gay person in the congregation? Would they really read this portion so blithely if they knew that sitting next to them in shul is a gay person whom they know? Or worse, perhaps, they know well that we are here and are intending our humiliation. The ordinariness of the reading about a sexual perversity worthy of death for a young person going through puberty is nothing short of suffocating. While we know that, and Rabbi Greenberg writes this, and I think I'll add just a parenthetical in a moment, while we know that people are no longer put to death for such things, and sadly we know that they are as we track the actions of ISIS and others in that part of the world, when the verse is read with no attempt to condition, explain, or contain the content, it leads inevitably to anxiety, debilitating self-hatred, overwhelming fears of rejection, and the portent of communal shame. Moreover, what of the mother and father of the child who has just braved the challenge of coming out to his parents? What do these verses mean to them? Now in their own closet, guilt-ridden, confused, and burdened with fears. Can the siblings who know the truth remain trusting of the Torah and comfortable in a community that so characterizes their loved sister or brother? And while the verse cannot and should not be excised, excised, it also cannot be passed over unmentioned. The only remedy is speech. Whether in the form of an introduction to the parsha or a sermon, we must begin to hear these verses as if standing in the shoes of a 15-year-old who knows exactly what his crush on the cute boy in his class means. It means he is an abomination if he listens to Torah. We can say publicly that the verse only speaks of actions and not feelings, but even a teenager knows that such dodging will, save him from dis will not save him from disgrace if he ever shares his feelings. While it is not okay to be silent, it must be admitted that different communities will be able and ready to say different things. It may not matter exactly what is said as long as compassion for the child in the pews trying to make sense of her feelings is the purpose. It must justify hope and not the vain hope of therapeutic or spiritual transformation, but the hope that somehow, just as she is, her life will work out. Rabbis can make a huge difference. They can stand in the way of a downward spiral by fully identifying with the subjective reality of a teenager, listening well to th these two verses in their shul. Orthodox rabbis may not now or ever have, fully, have a fully embracing stance, but they can adopt the existential crisis of the teens struggling to square their religious world with their emerging self-awareness. It's a process of empathy that has already begun. Eight years ago, I interviewed 20 Orthodox rabbis on their practice of counsel when gay people come out to them. I discovered then that my colleagues were eager to do no harm, but were not sure how to balance that concern with their role as defenders of the tradition. They each insisted that celibacy was required by the tradition. I said that I understood their position theoretically, and then I situated the issues. A teenager shares with you, frightened and confused, Rabbi, I'm in trouble. I know that I'm gay. I've known it for years. Can you tell me what you believe God wants of me? Do you really tell him? I asked. Do you really tell him that what God wants of him is lifelong celibacy? I began to unpack the simple statement. Did you say to a do you say to a frightened kid, 
What God wants is that you should never touch or be touched, never kiss, never embrace, and never share intimate love with anyone. When you are sick, no partner will care for your body, and when you are joyous, no one will dance with you. And all this because something is terribly wrong with you? Most of the rabbis paused at this point, and some tried to dodge the quandary. I did not judge their response. I just wanted them to grasp the vulnerability of the young person before them and the emotional havoc they could cause by simply sharing with no reservations their halachic, which is Jewish law, convictions. In a few of these encounters, the rabbis, recognizing the puzzle I had put before them, wanted to see how I would navigate it. One senior rabbi, a one-time head of the Rabbinical Council of America, did just that. I don't really know what I would say, Steve. What would you say? I offered him the following response. To be honest, I share your question. I too don't know why a God, why a good and loving God would make people gay and then deprive them of a decent life. I honestly don't know what I would do were I in your shoes and your struggle humbles me. However, as a rabbi, I am stuck. I can't permit what is prohibited, but I also can't condemn you for wanting a full human life. God knows you and loves you just as you are and can only ask you to do the doable. If you cannot be celibate without doing yourself great harm, then it will be best for you to find a partner, join a shul, and seek a way to make a family. Living a full and religiously alive life as a self-accepting gay person is better than you walking away from a community forever. Someday you will go to heaven and have to account for yourself. I feel that you have a very good argument to make. So do the best you can and trust in God's love and understanding. That was Rabbi Greenberg's response. And again, I would go further, but he was constrained within his orthodoxy. And then he adds, I don't know how many orthodox rabbis might be comfortable responding in this way to a vulnerable teenager, but among those whom I'm interviewed, even some of the most conservative of the group, this approach seemed acceptable. At the end of my research, one young rabbi upped the ante. He added the following. Steve, not only can I say that, but I want to add to it this. If by chance I'm hanging around up there in heaven when you are called to judgment, I promise you now that when you make that argument before God, I'll be there right behind you cheering you on. Perhaps this is enough. To voice a simple question before the reading, to adopt the existential crisis of the teen struggling with his love of God and his hope for life with love, intimacy, and companionship, like everyone else. Not a rejection of the Torah, but an honest and heartfelt identification with the thousands of people who hear the verses and are in despair. And then Rabbi Greenberg adds the following, and I want to share it with you also as well. I've written a short prayer. It will not be right for every shul. It may not go far enough for some and will be too bold for others, but perhaps it's a way to start a conversation with that child in the back row that for the first time feels in the recognition a glimmer of hope. If this prayer is too explicit or not in line with the vibe of the shul, then don't read it. It will be fine. Do what is appropriate, but do something, because it's not okay to be silent when people are hurting. And this is his prayer to be recited at the reading of Achremot. Master of the universe, to whom all secrets are known, before you we stand both confused and undaunted. In Parshat Achremot, abomination is spoken. And one out of ten men and women hear the words Zeit Zachar, Vet Zachar, and weep in the farthest most pews, outcast and broken. As we read these words now, God, remember in truth the myriad of souls who from their youth found in their hearts a fierce connection a mighty love towards members of their own sex. Remember, O oh Lord, their paralyzing fear, their terrifying longing, the shaming embrace, accusing themselves with the full force of law of perversions that could only be remedied by death. Remember the thousands consumed by shame, cast out in outrage or suffering unseen. Not one dared imagine that rather than cursed, they were blessed by the one who varies his creations. Master of the universe, why? 
and have the tears of the oppressed made it through to your heart? Can it be that the Torah demands we cast out beloved daughters, beloved sons? If they have no power and no redress, then be thou their comfort, their strength and fortress. Bless us with peace and our sages with tenderness. Grant us strength from on high to uphold them in love. Be generous with the gift of hope from above. For life and wholeness, your salvation is at hand. Amen. Again, the words of Rabbi Steve Greenberg, the thoughts and sentiments maybe of many of us. Keni hirat son, may it be God's will. Our service continues, page 586, we rise for Elaine. 